Hi guys, this is a video on Manjula Patmanabhan's play, Harvest. Harvest is the most famous play by Manjula Patmanabhan and it is a play with a lot of contemporary relevance because it is about globalization, it is about organ trade, it is about the unequal exploitative relations between the first world and the third world. Manjula Patmanabhan was born in 1953 and uh, she was born in Delhi to a diplomat family. Manjula Patmanabhan was the daughter of a diplomat and she grew up to be a journalist, a playwright and a children's author. She also did some comic strip uh, writing. Lights Out is a 1984 play that is uh, quite famous. It is also prescribed in some universities. Lights Out is a realistic play that generated a lot of discussion and it mainly deals with the theme of violence against women. It is the sensitive issue of a gang rape probing various questions pertaining to exploitation of women, both within the family and in the society. Manjula Patmanabhan talks about man-woman rela man relationships and the patriarchal power uh, that subjugate women in a society. Uh, it is a play based on a real incident that took place in Santa Cruz, in Mumbai in 1982 and two years later she wrote a play about it. The play is set in an apartment, a sixth floor apartment in Mumbai where an upper middle class couple Leela and Bhaskar are living. They have been hearing sounds of sexual crimes uh, from their neighboring building and uh, the dramatist explores the reactions of men and women to this sexual assault. I think Martin Amis has also written a novel about uh, sexual violence and people's reaction to it. Please read this play. Hidden Fires is another work. It's a series of monologues. Escape is a 2008 work. It is science fiction for adults. Manjula Patmanabhan has also created Suki, an Indian comic character. And it was serialized as a comic strip in Sunday Observer. Manjula Patmanabhan's other works are Hot Death, Cold Soup, Kleptomania, Three Virgins and other stories. She has also illustrated 24 books for children, including for her own novels, Mouse Attack and Mouse Invaders. Now let us talk about Harvest. It's a 1996 play uh, about illegal organ trade. It was uh, in 1994 uh, or 5 that she went to Chennai uh, to visit her sister and she came across the brutal reality of organ trade. She came to know about villagers who wore hospital gowns and sterile masks because they were recovering from kidney transplant surgery. And when she heard about this, she got horrified by what is happening because of poverty. And at that time, she heard uh, about a drama competition. There was an international drama competition sponsored by the Alexander Onassis Foundation for a new unpublished and unperformed play. The foundation was uh, named after the late son of Aristotle Onassis. And it was the first time that this award was being offered for an original theatrical play. And in 1997, she got that prize for this play. The theme of the competition was the challenges facing mankind in the 21st century. Following its international premiere in Greece in 1999, 
The play has been performed over the years by theatre groups around the world. In 2002, the very famous Govind Nihalani directed Deham or Body, a bilingual feature film in Hindi and English based on the play. The play has been published in three international anthologies and they are Black and Asian Plays, Post-Colonial Plays, an anthology and Watsworth Anthology of Drama. Harvest is about organ trade and its impact on the poor sections of the society. And uh, it features the cannibalistic exploitation of the first world citizens of the third world youth. When the th first world people buy organs from the third world, it is like a consumeristic uh, preying upon the third world. It is cannibalistic. And Harvest discusses the implications of a Mephistophelian deal that eventually deals with annihilation. The entire family is destroyed because of this Mephistophelian deal. It is like the protagonist Om Prakash is selling not his body but his soul to the devil. It is a Faustian theme. The unequal power relation between the first world and the third world is what is uh, the basis of the play. The play shows a dystopian future of extreme inhuman consumerism and corporatization. It's a dystopian future where people have completely been devalued. Dehumanization has led to uh, people being used as commodities. The play is also about technology and its negative impact on human life. How technology takes over and what is human becomes non-human. The question of bioethics, how ethical it is to do organ trade. How far do you have right over your body? Do you have the right to do anything that you want with your body? Things like that. The play's brilliant satire fully takes in first world attitudes towards India. The first world has a fear of diseases. It has an anxiety about sanitation. And it has a complete incomprehension regarding family and social life. It's ignorance of third world reality altogether. The first world representative Ginny in the play is shocked to see that there is no bathroom in the house. There are hundreds and thousands of families who live without a bathroom in their house in India. And she asked, Ginny asked very insensitive questions, such as she asked J Jaya, do you take a bath? Do you take a bath every day? It has the first world's uh, obsession with sanity and cleanliness has led to the situation where they don't have immunity, which is probably why COVID spread so much in the West. And the first world people have, have no idea about family and social life either. Virgil tries to approach Jaya and implant his semen in her so that they can have a child. Absurd. Jaya thinks it's absurd. Now the background and the setting, it's a three act play. Especially the second and third acts are divided into scenes. The play is set a few years in the future in a crammed one room apartment in a Bombay chowl. Chowl means a very uh, dingy flat where a lot of homeless and poor people are living uh, in cramped settings. Obvious, obviously, as I've told you, the theme is organ trade. The donors are Indians and the receivers are North Americans. The Indians are donating their organs and the organs are received by the first world North Americans. It revolves around a family of four characters. There are four main characters. Om is a 20 year old man. man. He's just a boy actually. And uh, these people are denied their childhood and youth. He is already the breadwinner of the family. He has been laid off from his clerical job. 
he is of medium height nervous and thing a very ordinary man jaya is his wife thin and haggard looking older than her 19 years even though they are so young they already have no sexual relationship jaya's bright cotton sari has faded with repeated washing to a meek pink ma is om's mother 60 years old scrawny and crabby she wears a widow's threadbare white sari jitu is om's younger brother he is 17 years old and handsome he works as a male prostitute and has a dashing easy going likable personality jaya is frustrated in her marriage and she is having a relationship with jitu and uh, living a wayward life of freedoms jitu also gets some venereal disease in the play uh then we have other minor characters like bidyut bai an elderly neighbor very similar in appearance to ma but timid and self effacing bidyut bai comes into their house to use the toilet there is a the crowd of urchins outside the door the crowd is audible rather than visible jinni is the american receiver is that is what we think the audience can hear her voice and see her face through the contact module the contact module is like a tv screen and like in 1984 the oppressors or the first world uh, organ receivers they maintain constant contact with the indian family jinni is blonde and white and she's the she's very pretty she's the epitome of the american style youth goddess virgil i will not tell you that it's a it's a spans you have to wait and see who virgil is he is never seen in the play and he has a very stylish american cigarette commercial accent that is rich and smoky artificial and he is attractive and rugged then there are the guards the guards are a group of three commando like characters who bear the same relationship to one another whenever they appear and guard one is the leader of the team he is a man in his mid 40s of military bearing guard two is a young and efficient woman attractive and unsmiling guard 3 is a clone of guard 2 and only guard 1 interacts with the donors the agents are also there they are space age delivery persons om prakash's mother buys a video couch on which she can lie and watch tv without any contact with the outside world and uh, the agents deliver it the agents are space age delivery persons and their uniforms are fantastical verging on the ludicrous like the costumes of waiters in exotic restaurants i am reminded of waiters in exotic restaurants i am also reminded of nurses in expensive hospitals like machines they are supposed to be and their roles are interchangeable with the guards though it must be clear that they do not belong to the same agency now the play begins act 1 begins when jaya and ma are talking and they are waiting for om to come home and om has been searching for a job daily uh and today when he comes home he has got a job om has previously lost his job because of his lack of expertise in computer skills and he selected for the new job as an organ donor 
where he agrees to donate his organs by contractual promise through Interplanta Services to the American woman Ginny. And what he gets in return is a small fortune. It is not even big money. At Interplanta Services, the selection process was very dehumanized. There was a long queue with nearly 6,000 people and they were all like machines made to stand in a queue and they were inspected. They had to take off their clothes and put, that, put back their clothes on. When they took off their clothes, they were sprayed with some medicinal water. Like animals in a cage they were. They were asked to sit, stand, move head to one side, then to another side and so on and on and on. And Om keeps on repeating that it was like being inside a cage, inside a tunnel. And we are reminded of the organs inside the body, like the intestine. Like Margaret Atwood's edible woman. It is like these poor people of the third world are being consumed. They are consumables. They are commodities. They are inside the intestine of the first world. I hope you understand. And having passed the medical examination at Interplanta, Om has been considered as an eligible and healthy candidate for selling the rights to his entire body to a buyer in the first world. Since Interplanta needs only the services of bachelors, that is what Om is thinking. Om is forced to conceal the fact that he is married and hence Jaya has to masquerade as her sister, as his sister. Actually, it was a misunderstanding. Actually, the Interplanta people were looking for couples because at the end of the play, we realized that they want not only Om, but they also want Jaya to bear children. We'll come to that later. At first, Ma does not know what is happening. She does not know what job he is going to do. And they're all baffled. When Ma comes to know about uh, why J how, how Jaya has to be pretending to be his sister, she's furious and Om defends his position by saying that they are mere words. Sister or wife, they are mere words. It's not going to really change their relationship. But Om was wrong. It does change their relationship. These are not merely words. It does change their relationship. And uh, look at what Om says. Om, nothing has changed. The words are different, that's all. And Ma says, but those aren't words, they are people. According to the terms of his contract, he and his immediate family, that is his wife Jaya, who is forced to pretend to be his sister, his brother Jitu, his mother, mother Ma, all will enjoy a first world standard of living and lifestyle. That means they will be clean, they will be well fed, they will be entertained and wealthy. To some extent, until the receiver demands Om's organs for his or her own survival. Even though at first, Om is elated at the prospect of the money that he's going to get. A complex feeling of hope and despair becomes apparent in Om's face after signing the contract. Initially, he is very excited to get the new job, which offers him an unexpected financial support. Om tells mother, we'll have more money than you and I have names for. Who would believe there is so much money in the world? But the actual situation that compels him to sign the contract becomes clear when he says to Jaya, Om says, I went because I lost my job at the company. And why did I lose it? Because I'm a clerk and nobody needs clerks anymore. There are no new jobs now. There's nothing left for people like us. Don't you know that? Poor Om had done this because of desperation. 
and there is a post human angle to the whole play the human is becoming post human he narrates the non human instructions at the time of his selection procedure om says i just do what i have to do all the time the ground keeps moving he's talking about the queue and uh, then at the end the ground stops we are back on our feet there are steps it must be on the other side of the building and as we come down guards are standing there waiting for us and to me they say you come and that was it he is selected ma says i can't believe it jaya says are they mad and uh, om said then these guards took down their names and addresses and all that then they gave them the packets because om had come home with a packet and said that they should not open the packet the guards will come and give them instructions om's further narration makes it clear that all these men in the line were ordered and monitored by the instructions being given by faceless machines the warmth of human life human relations has gone out of their company om says they told us we had been selected they wrote down our names addresses and this that all details then they gave us these packets told us not to open them and said we must go home the guards would come for us with final instructions the next uh, slide i have titled machines the guards arrive at home's residence to activate the installation and they set up the contact module sanitize the house dismantle the kitchen and finally bring out a cooking device and bottles full of multicolored pellets jaya is indignant that they are messing up with her kitchen their kitchen might not be the best but it is still their kitchen what right do the guards or jinni have to mess up with their life jito is not present during the installation process the guards recommend that those family members who are absent should make themselves available at the nearest registration center not later than 24 hours from the time of their departure failing which such member will lose all rights to the facilities provided by interplanter services this is almost complete control over their lives jitu does not report jitu lives a free life he values his freedom he makes fun of the organ transplant business and he is very critical of om prakash and he gives jaya love jaya's and geetu's sorry jitu's and jaya's meeting is described at the end of act 1 then there begins the play of machines and machine like men who are representatives of the machine world instructing commanding interfering and grabbing the human lives the interplanter guards refer to cooking or food making as fuel preparation as if the people are not even human beings they say guard one says guard two or three never speak remember all implements of personal fuel preparation will be supplied exclusively by interplanta services it's like call center dialogue henceforth you and your domestic unit will consume only those fuels which will be made available by interplanta we will provide you more than enough for the unit described in your data sheet but will forbid you from sharing selling or by any means whatsoever commercially exploiting the facility 
Before leaving the house, the guards thank Om for his cooperation and appreciate him for his contribution towards creating a healthier, happier and longer lived world. What is happening is the first world people are buying the organs from the third world people because the first world people want to live longer. They don't want to die. They are conquering death. And through the contact module, there is constant surveillance and control. The contact module is installed at Ohm's house and it begins to operate. The purpose of the contact module is to interact with Ohm when Ginny wants to provide instructions. Ginny is the receiver. She is a very pretty American, young American woman and she completely controls them. The playwright describes the movements of the contact module. Gatu moves swif swiftly over to the contact module and points a remote at it. There are musical notes and clicks. A screen saver pattern appears. The contact module moves, is raised and lowered a couple of times, then switched off again. Ginny looks in on them through the contact module installed in the room. The contact module acts like a demigod as Ginny can observe what the family members do at home. She is watching everything and even interfering with their intimate life. Here Ginny begins to control the whole family without being physically present at the donor's residence. This is so much like 1984. Ginny enforces her power through technology enabled surveillance. And Jaya, Om's wife and Ma are instructed to keep Om happy and healthy so that his organs remain healthy, fit to be transplanted. Everybody should be smiling. His organs should also be smiling. Ginny says, Zaya, she cannot pronounce Jaya properly. You see, it's important to smile all through the day. After all, if you're not smiling, it means you're not happy. And if you're not happy, you might affect your brothers because remember, Om is presented as Jaya's brother. If you're not happy, you might affect your brother's mind and then where would we be? The receiver Ginny can see Om, his family members and all other aspects of his life. Om's life is laid bare before Ginny. But Om does not know anything about Ginny. He sees only her face, hears her sweet voice. Later, we come to know that Ginny is only a computer generated image. Ginny is an avatar. She is not a real person. The real person is Virgil. And he is using Ginny to communicate to them. So Ginny even the appearance of Ginny or the face of Ginny that they see is deceptive. The electronic devices are like real characters in the play. The control contact module, I mean, is like a real character. And the whole thing is a game of machines and machine like men. When Ginny comes to know that the family shares a single toilet with 40 other people, Ma has to walk to two floors to go to the toilet. Ginny is appalled and immediately orders Interplanter Services to install a separate toilet in Ohm's house, even though there is no space for it. The family members are disciplined to follow strict timings. They have to eat at the right time. If they are late to eat lunch, Ginny will not like it. Remember, Ginny doesn't care for them. She does it purely from the perspective of her own profit. Because she wants their organs to be healthy so that when she uses them, she will not be in trouble. Thus establishing a permanent module of surveillance at the donor's place, she becomes like an omnipresent god. Out of fear and desperation, 
Om urges his family members to obey the instructions of Ginny. Om urges his family members to obey the instructions of Ginny. He is always telling them, don't do this, don't do that because Ginny will not like it. They are living according to Ginny's likes and dislikes. Not only has Om sold his body to Ginny, it looks like he has sold his entire family's freedom to her. The soul of the family. Ginny is like the omnipresent God regulating and governing the world of the donors. Ginny is so domineering and patronizing. When Bidyut Bai comes, Ginny says, What's that you said, Mrs. Proy Cash? Instead of Prakash, Ginny says Proy Cash. Instead of Jaya, she says Zaya. Someone at the door. Then Jaya says, Oh, for God's sake, she treats us like children. Ginny, what, Zaya? Look, all of you, I have told you once, I have told you a zillion times. I hate it when you all speak at once. They can't even speak inside their own house. They can't get a cold. Jaya is suspected of having a cold and Jenny gets really upset. Initially, Ma does not know what is happening. She does not realize what is Om's new job. But when she begins to get the hints as to what Om's new job involves, she becomes obsessed with her telescreen or uh, TV and very soon she is not really bothered. She just wants all the amenities and facilities at home. She wants Jaya to do all the work and she herself is not bothered. A video couch is brought for Ma to entertain her. Remember the agents bring it and it stops her human interaction. I'm reminded of Nell in uh, Endgame. Nell is Ham's mother. Nag and Nell, the parents, are living inside trash cans. In this world, we are all living inside tra trash cans, metaphorically. Remember? Understand? And Ma gets a video couch inside which she is shut up. The video couch is the virtual reality which she inhabits. As the uh, narrative progresses, we find that Ma has become accustomed to her luxurious life with an array of gadgets provided by the receiver Ginny in order to keep the donor's family happy. This unexpected reversal of fortune and luxury make, makes Ma uh, blind to the actual realities. All these gadgets they are, that they are provided with make them numb. They do not see the real plight that they are in. And uh, remember Jitu was living a very free life and now he comes home without uh, reporting to the Interplanda people. He comes home. Jaya really cares for him. Jaya was evidently distressed about Om's decision on signing himself to Ginny because the family is already on a troubled relationship. Because Jaya is having a secret relationship with Om's younger brother, Jitu. And uh, Jitu now comes home. Ma hates him. Ma favors Om more than the others. Om is the earning member. And Om is addressed with endearments such as my only delight. Whereas Jaya, her daughter-in-law and Jitu, her younger Unemployed son are abused. Ho you, barren dog, pimping rascal, soul's disgrace. These are some of the words that she uses for them.
then uh, Jaya's compassion for him, for Jitu that is, makes her take care of him when he comes back sick and covered with sores. Om discourages his wife from taking care of his brother Jitu because he thinks that Jinni will not like it. Jitu has not reported at Interplanta as per the contract and he is not recognized by the contact module. Om, yes, I'm sorry. You had your chance. Om is telling Jitu. You chose to leave. We had to make our excuses to the guards to explain why the fourth member of the family was not here. Now it's too late to take you back in. And in any case, you are undoubtedly a health hazard. Then Jitu replies with a lot of sarcasm. A health hazard, you say? Hey, it's rich. That word is rich. Me, a health hazard? My brother, I'm not a health hazard. I'm a walking, talking health catastrophe. Om's family gets anxious over Jitu's presence in the house. Om does not want Jinni to find out Jitu through the contact module. Meanwhile, Jitu has been shaved because Jaya has been taking care of him. He is cleaner. Jaya has washed him. He has been attended to. His wounds have been attended to. Om asks Jaya to wear gloves while nursing Jitu. But she refuses and says that the family is responsible for Jitu's present condition. And the least they can do is to risk their skin when they touch him. She has a humane side left, while the others do not. Om's new life with his family often surrounded with the luxury of food and with services that they are not used to. They are not used to all these services and luxuries. And only Jaya realizes the price that Om is going to pay in return for all this luxury provided by the donors. She opposes his move and the tactics of deception. Jaya, what faith you have in them? You don't, they don't care about any of us. Jaya does not trust the uh, donors or the company. They don't care about any of us. Not as people, not as human beings. And then Om says, what are you saying? You don't talk enough to Ginny. If you did, you would not feel this way. And Ma is angry with Jaya. She is jealous of our Ginny angel. Look at her face, pinched with envy. Om says, she really cares for us. He says that about Ginny. And Jaya says, oh yes, she cares. Just as much as she cares about the chicken she eats for dinner. Jaya says, Ginny is consuming us. We are almost like the chicken she eats for dinner. Finally, when the moment of transplant occurs, the guards appear and accidentally grab Jitu as the donor instead of Om who has signed the contract. That is the height of irony. Uh, instead of taking Om, they grab Jitu and go. After all this care that they had taken, they grab Jitu. Out of fear, Om has been hiding under the table. Despite Jaya's clarification that Jitu is not the donor, she was protesting. The guards take him away. Jitu comes back escorted by the guards and he has bandages over his eyes. He is now blind. Guard 1 informs the family that the transplant has been a tremendous success. And hence, the donor's family will receive every benefit and consideration due to them under the terms of the contract. 
Remember, Jitu used to value his freedom a lot. Now Jitu is blind, and in his place, in the place of his eyes, there are enormous goggles that look like a pair of imitation eyes. And you know what is happening? Ginny is projecting the video image of herself into the goggles, and he can see that. He does not see reality, he only sees what is being projected into his eyes. Ginny is controlling what he sees. He has completely no freedom now and he is totally mind controlled. Although Jitu had been the most critical of the organ donation schemes, now all he can see is Ginny's sultry image. He is completely seduced. He is ready to donate his entire body. When Jaya tells Jitu that Jini doesn't exist, Jitu doesn't believe her. Jitu tells Jaya, she exists. That is enough for me. She is a goddess and she exists. I would do anything for her. Anything. Jini is talking to Jitu and addressing him as Om. Ginny is um, t saying, that's right, Om, it's me, Ginny, you are seeing. Because I'm beaming my video image straight into your mind. So you can see me right in front of you. All of me, for once, not just my face. Well, what do you think? Jitu slowly moves around, looking at something that no one else in the room with him can see. Jitu says, it is, you are beautiful, like magic. Jini says, you like me, Om? You like what you see? And Jitu says, I can't help but like it. Who wouldn't? Those plants, that light... What are those things there? It's beautiful. Beautiful. I have never seen anything like this. Never. Jitu, who used to value his freedom, is now willingly submitting himself to Jini. He's ready to do anything. Give her his entire body. He, she turns off the video session and instructs the guards to take him a second time. The guards immediately arrive at Om's residence. And announce that they have been intimated of Om's willingness to participate in the second phase of transplant service. They take Jitu along with them. This time Jitu has not shown any kind of protest. It is Jaya who is protesting. Jaya. Jitu. Jitu, don't call me that. Jaya, don't go j just yet. Please, it's too soon. They have not explained anything. I, we, you'll never be the same again. Jitu, you have your husband to look after. He needs you than I. Jaya, what happened to your ideals, your freedoms, your pride? All gone, so easily gone. After some time, actually two months have passed after uh, Om has sold his rights. Now, some agents arrive with the video couch. Model Excel 5000. Ma has ordered it online. After setting it up, the agents help Ma to lie down in the chamber, telling her to relax and experience ultimate bliss. The agents shut the lid, seal the edges. She can't even get out now and lock them. Ma is completely delinked from the outside world. She's inside the video couch. <laughs> when Jaya asks them how Ma will breathe, feed, relive, relieve herself, the agent replies, Ma'am, it's a total comfort unit, ma'am. We have a full recycling and biofeed-in processor. 
your relative will have no further need from the outside world. From now on, till she chooses to de-link. She can't de-link because she is inside. Everything is now in the customer's operation. The unit is wholly self-sufficient. It looks like the machine is empowering the customer, but the reality is not so. Total self-sufficiency, ma'am. These are just words. That is not what the meaning is. There is nothing to be done. I am reminded of the feeding machine in our uh, modern times, the movie by Charlie Chaplin. Then you meet Virgil. I told you it's a suspense. Ma is completely addicted to her video couch. couch. And Om leaves the house at this time. Goes to Interplanta saying that it is his only chance now. Jaya doesn't stop him. And Jaya is left alone to fend for herself. A voice talks to her from the contact module. And Jaya is shocked when she realizes that Ginny was a computer generated image. A computer animated wet dream. The real customer is Virgil, an old man who was using Ginny to communicate with them. Jaya realizes the seriousness of the situation when the real receiver of the body organs of Jitu, Virgil, at first he talks to her, then he appears before her in the contact module. And he looks like Jitu because now he has completely moved into Jitu's body. Jitu is no more. Virgil has moved into his body. Virgil reveals that he was old and sick and the real objective of buying the body of Jitu was to retain his youth forever. <laughs> and uh, Virgil had observed Jaya through the module. He admired her spirited nature and he needs Jaya. He says, we are interested in women where I live, Jaya. Childbearing women. Jaya is shocked. Jaya cannot imagine bearing a child for a contact module. He further says that his country has lost the art of having children and is now in the process of getting bodies from poorer countries. Now there is an older generation and a younger generation. The older generation is also in young bodies. Jaya is enticed by Virgil. He entices her with sweet words and with the promise of sensual pleasures to accept the implant which will make insemination possible. Artificially, she will get pregnant from him and bear his child. But Jaya will not hear of it. She wants to attain motherhood, but she's not ready to get it by sacrificing her womanhood. She demands that if he needs her, he has to come to her in person. Of course, Virgil refuses because her world would be a health hazard for him. She insists that she will not deal with the phantom any longer. Finally, she blackmails him by threatening him with suicide. Jaya says that she's going to collect all the pills and medicines around her and take the ones for staying awake. If he doesn't come in person, she will take her life. Jaya says, I'll die knowing that you, who live only to win, will have lost to a poor, weak and helpless woman. And I'll get more pleasure out of that first moment of death than I have had in my entire life so far. In the meantime, she tells him to learn to pronounce her name correctly. Thus, her spirit remains unconquered even in the face of insurmountable odds. She fights for her rights as a woman and as a human being. The play ends with Jaya setting her own terms and conditions. Look at the ending. Virgil says, Zaya, no, no, Jaya, Jaya, Jaya. 
because she asked him to pronounce her name correctly jaya listen to me virgil says and jaya says no you listen to me i want to be left alone i don't want to hear any sounds i don't want any disturbances i'm going to take my pills watch tv have a dozen baths a day eat for three instead of one for the first time in my life and maybe the last time of my life i'm going to enjoy myself i suggest you take some rest you have a long journey ahead of you and it's sure to be a hard one she settles down in her couch and watches tv there is happy music heard jaya has lost everything her husband her lover jitu everything has gone because of virgil and now she wants to deal with him on her own terms so that is the powerful ending of the play the significance of the title harvest the title refers to the cutting of crops here body organs for consumption there is a materialistic exploitation of nature also indicated by the word harvest nature is exploited commodification of human beings and relationships also is indicated human beings and their bodies are like commodities they can be bought and sold and used and consumed harvest also denotes caring for land or people so as to get the best products from it we care for the land because we want the best produce from it like that jini or virgil cares for the family because they want the best organs from them the title refers to an agricultural life and it is an ironic reminder of how unnatural and technocratic our society has become the exploitative and consumptive relationship of the first world with the third world is also indicated here in the title another major theme of the play is capitalism and exploitation late capitalism and cannibalistic neo imperialism in the third world countries the first world has ended its colonialism but neo colonialism and neo imperialism has started manjula patmanabhan shows that the exploitation of the third world population by the first world is still dominant but in a different guise the organ trade is one of the new ways of exploitation the organ markets run by the first world take advantage of the poverty stricken third world people who do not have any choice but to sell their body parts the poor people are selling their body parts body trafficking and organ trade analogous to slave trade is a very important thing the organ trade and body trafficking happening at this time is analogous to the slave trade of the early colonial period in both these there is dehumanization involved and within the third world the poor people are forming a fourth world Iro- there is an ironic reversal of the notions of wealth comfort and happiness in this play even when they consume they are also being consumed ma is a consumer watching tv video couch but they are also being consumed amidst to such inequalities and abuse of power by the rich and the powerful people in the west there are also people like jaya and jitu also despite their poverty they resist jitu's life of freedom and his source his being taken away instead of om prakash all these are in a way indicative of the resistance 
Jaya, despite their poverty, does not succumb to the lure of money and holds on to her human dignity. This play is about the impact of globalization on the third world. What is globalization? Globalization involves the fluid movement of bodies or organs or capital across national boundaries causing this juncture. And uh, this is Arjun Apadure's theory. This juncture, ethnoscape. And globalization is the movement of things or people or money or media or ideology from one part of the world to another. And also increasing consumption. All these are themes in the play. The play is an indictment against America, the greatest promoter of globalization and liberalization, because Ginny, the receiver of the body parts, is American. She controls the family of the donor until Virgil appears and Jaya resists at the end. The play exposes the true extent of psychological coercion in the globalization world. It also shows the patterns of seduction and policing that the developed world imposes on the developing world. The developed world seduces the developing world to make more money, to buy more things, to consume and be consumed. And the developing world is also, world is also controlled completely by the first world. The deceptive lure of globalization is evident when Om says, we will have more money than you, can, you and I have names for. Who would believe there is so much money in the world? Also, the gaze of the patriarch and the corporations. The contact module thus seems to be a sort of demigod. The contact module is always there, controlling them like a god. It does not fail to remind Om that the slightest trace of dishonesty on his part can be detected. He cannot hide anything from Ginny. It induces a feeling of helplessness in the family. The situation becomes oppressive when Ginny demands an accurate report of every sneeze and every smile. Ginny compares Ohm's flat to a human goldfish bowl, which she can observe and amuse herself with. So the gaze of the colonizer, the gaze of the patriarch and the corporations. Panopticon. Michel Foucault looks at the paradigm of a sophisticated mechanism of observation and surveillance that he got from Jeremy Bentham, the 17th century philosopher. This architectural panopticon is a circular edifice with a tower at the center that ensures constant observation of the inmates in the isolated cells of the outer ring. There is a central watchtower around which there are isolated cells. And the supervisor in the tower at the center is able to do constant surveillance. The underlying principle of the panopticon is the total and constant surveillance of inmates, patients, workers, etc. through the control of their minds. Controlling people's minds and thereby monitoring them, doing surveillance on them. According to Bentham, this is a new mode, Jeremy Bentham, the 17th century philosopher, this is a new mode of obtaining power of mind over mind. <laughs> without physical power, physical coercion. It is a power that controls you mentally without using any physical force. But it is the body that is at stake in this functioning of power. The victory of panoptic surveillance technique is evident when Om discourages Jaya's decision to nurse Jitu back to health. After Jitu's return to home from a miserable existence on the pavements, because he is afraid of being found out, 
because Ginny has constant surveillance on them. Om sees this as a display of sentimentality, a weakness which he knows Ginny will disapprove of. A miniature version of the panoptic system can be perceived in Om's mother's total absorption in the fantasy world. She is also completely trapped in the virtual world. All these are analogous to 1984, the surveillance systems in 1984. Ma willingly shuts herself off from the outside world, from the outward manifestations of life. She is unmoved even when she sees her son Jitu being taken away by the guards. This shows hegemony or willing submission to an oppressive ideology. She is passively supporting the ideology now. All of them begin to support except for Jaya, Jitu, Om, Ma. All of them succumb willingly. The super deluxe video couch she orders for herself is representative of a self-imposed withdrawal. Om's mother's renunciation of the world is complete, unhesitating and unquestioning. She chooses for herself electronic annihilation. She will die inside the video couch like Nell died in the trash can in Endgame. Endgame by Samuel Beckett. What are some of the other concerns in the play? The play is also about body politics. The social surveillance, regulation and consumption of the body of Om, of Jitu and retaliation by partly Jitu and then Jaya. Even though Jitu succumbs at the end, there is a streak of rebellion in him at the beginning. Commodification of the body in different ways is also part of body politics through organ trade as well as flesh trade. Jitu is in the flesh trade. At the end, Jaya is also in the flesh trade. She has to deliver a child for Virgil. So, commodification of the body. The body becomes a commodity. Uh, another theme is liminality or in-between existence. Neither belonging, neither here nor there. Liminality, fragmentation, identity crisis of the post-colonial subject. These are other themes. Liminality, fragmentation and identity crisis of the post-colonial subject. And uh, other concerns are Post-humanist dystopia, the novel presents a post-humanist dystopia and the effects of cyber culture and technology on our lives. There is a threat to human physical identity posed by technology. We are changing in our physical, natural form. There is a digitization of identities. We become a number like you see in Auden's Unknown Citizen. You become your Aadhaar number, digitization of identities. You lose your original identity. There is also a deconstructive view of the notions of health care. Health care is not as great as it seems. Health care has its pitfalls. Technological progress has its pitfalls. Poverty alleviation is not done in the best way. Social development is not done in the best way. Subaltern resistance, especially of Jaya, even to some extent Jitu. New conceptions of privacy and security. What we consider to be privacy or security, is it really good? Is it what we want, does it bring us what we seek? Such questions are raised in the play. And it has a Faustian theme. The protagonist selling his soul to the devil. Selling his body and soul. In Frankenstein, there is the element of resisting 
death and creating life mary shelley's frankenstein at that time human beings were experimenting with galvanization and other techniques to create life now that resistance of death is a gothic element that is there in this play also the first world people like virgil do not want to die they want scientific means of prolonging life so that theme is an archetypal theme it was it was there always in uh, you know modern human societies the resistance to death how to postpone death that is also a theme so that brings us to the end of the video i hope you enjoyed thank you very much